Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this is USGS. Welcome to our first Google Plus Hangout. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, tuning in and taking the time out of your day to uh, to follow us along and to listen. So my name is Scott Horvath, and I am the uh, social media lead for the USGS. And today we're going to be talking with uh, Sam Drogi. He is the head of our uh, bee inventory and monitoring lab, and they're the ones that do this amazing, uh, fantastic macro photography work uh, of the insects. And so we're going to talk a little bit about why they do this um, and what the goal is behind capturing these insects. And we'll show a little bit about um, the setup that they have, and we'll also talk about some do-it-yourself sort of uh, options that you can use for taking uh, this map photography uh, for yourself at home with your own camera equipment. So uh, we're also going to, um, well, like I said, <laughs> and so uh, right now uh, down on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, you should see the Hangout. You should see some of the work that uh, Sam and his team has put together. Uh, this is from their uh, Flickr page. It's, uh, the address is right over here to my right side. And his address, uh, the address for that page is flickr.com slash photos slash USGS BIML. And so you can take a look at that. Um, this particular set that you're looking at is called the eye candy set. So uh, with that, um, <clears throat> before we jump into the questions, uh, the one thing I did want to point out is that uh, while uh, Sam and his team uh, capture you know, not only bees and, and wasps and other insects, but there are many other creatures, pollinating creatures in this world. Um, the Department of the Interior and the USGS, as well as uh, other federal agencies and partners, are in North America are in the North American uh, Pollinator Protection Group. Uh, over 75% of flowering plants rely on pollinators, and they're also responsible for an estimated 15 billion dollars in services to agriculture alone in the United States. Uh, while the importance of healthy pollinator populations to agriculture is clear. Uh, pollinators are just as important to sustaining functioning ecosystems and the food supply uh, for wildlife. Now, you can learn more about um, some of this work at the North American Pollinator Protection Group at uh, pollinator.org slash NAPPC. So uh, also the USGS has done a, a podcast in the past talking about the importance of pollinators uh, for continuing growth of fresh fruit and vegetables, uh, how these creatures are important uh, to our agricultural society and more. Um, to look at that or to listen to that podcast, you can visit gallery.usgs.gov, uh, type the word bees into the search box, and choose the audio option, and you'll get that podcast. So uh, <clears throat> with all that said, Sam, uh, how's it going over there in the lab today? It's good. You're actually looking at my storeroom we're surrounded by bees here in those various boxes from lots of projects from National Park Service to the Forest Service to our own local collections and experiments. Great. So uh, can you give us a brief overview, basically, of the type of work that you do there at the Bee Inventory Monitoring Lab? And um, tell us a little bit about why you take the time to um, document these insects and creatures in such explicit detail. Sure. Actually, the pictures are really a sideline to a larger picture. The larger picture is that our lab designs and develops large-scale survey programs for plants and animals. It happens that right now we're mostly working on design and survey protocols and a way of talking about how bees are changing because bees are one of the, the groups that we're most concerned about, as Scott has mentioned. And as part of that, we've had to develop um, a set of identification guides. There's 4,000 species, about 400 of them are not um, even uh, documented, they don't have names yet. And so we have found that the technical literature is not adequate for many of the people who want to work on bees, um, who we are t we're advising them on how to develop survey programs, but you can collect bees rather easily. The problem is, what are they after they're collected? So as part of the process of making guides, which are available, and you could email us if you're interested in the specific locations of the guides, we need very, very high quality pictures to include with the guides because many of the people who are going to be working on bees won't have access to a collection, which would be the traditional way that you would compare your results. Like, I think it's species X. I'm going to go look up species X in the museum. Museums now are closing down and they don't have good access. So what we're pr trying to provide is 
quality pictures in which you can zoom right down to the level of the lines and the pits on the skin and the type of hair and the color of hair in exquisite detail so that a practitioner who has a bee, instead of going to the museum, simply looks up the pictures and says, yes, this is the bee that I thought it was, or, oh my god, this is not, I'm going to have to start all over, saving them a lot of trips and preventing errors. It also turns out, though, that, as uh, Scott has mentioned, that uh, for the first time you can really see how beautiful these animals are. And so what we want to do today is show you our techniques, um, how we have our lab set up for taking these pictures, um, which is moderately high-end. Uh, it's not uh, microscope level kinds of work. And how um, you or other people can do this with um, the kind of camera gear you might have around so that we can see more of these kinds of pictures available everywhere. Um, the techniques are not that difficult. Um, I think people have a feeling that we're using some sort of, of, uh, of uh, government uh, special tools and techniques that are not available to them. That's not true. It's just very detailed and not something that commonly occurs now because only recently has the software been available that allows you to stack these pictures. So, Scott, do you want me to just go into um, what uh, we're doing here and that, or do you have other questions you want me to so, address? Yeah, so let me uh, ask you another question because we're talking about this, uh, the detail work that you do on these insects. Can you explain, uh, before we get into that, how some of the challenges that you've experienced with this sort of uh, macro photography, with this such high detail photography of insects. Uh, I know that you and I talked, uh, we actually, I actually visited your lab this past weekend, um, and you know, I appreciate you for bringing me there, um, but you did, you did mention to me that there are some uh, things that you come across as far as when you're detailing uh, these insects in such great, you know, such great detail, that there are some things that pop up that you have to uh, overcorrect for or uh, some challenges with certain types of insects, their skin maybe, their hair, dust, whatever it might be. Can you sort of explain a little bit of that, those challenges? Sure, yeah. Actually, part of the photographic procedure that we go through, and initially we weren't that aware of because um, we didn't realize how detailed the pictures would be. So what happens is that you need to have very well prepared specimens um, at the level of the quality of the picture. So in other words, any little bit of dust, and a lot of these insects are just dust magnets. You think of bees, they're covered with hair, they gather pollen, they attract dust and lint and tiny little hairs. And so a lot of what we've had to do is find or prepare the specimens prior to um, taking their pictures so that we can achieve good pictures. So if you don't have good specimens or you just pick up a bug that you found on your windowsill, well, you're going to get a very ugly looking um, uh, picture, not because maybe your technique is bad, but simply because your preparation or the type of insect that you've used is poor, or whatever else, if you're using flowers, uh, those kinds of things. The same issues pop up, which is microscopic dust and dirt become apparent, as does things like bad hair and um, poorly formed uh, uh, antennae that you don't see by simply looking at the uh, bug initially. So I can show, let me, why don't I show up some of the specimens that, you know, what a, a group of specimens sure. might look like that we do. So here's a box from North Carolina. Let's see if I can do this right. And I'm going to hold it up to the camera. These are just rare specimens from the Sand Hills area of North Carolina that a uh, person who visited my lab from NC State, a grad student, uh, brought up to look at identifications. They were so uncommon we didn't have them in our collection and they were so good looking that we decided to ask them to leave them and we're, we're going to take pictures of them. Um, so prior to photography, I'm looking at them under the microscope to see if they look good. I choose what angles we're going to uh, portray and if I need to I can pick off some pieces of lint by uh, licking, I actually lick a pin and then I touch the pin that is slightly wet to the uh, tip of the specimen uh, where the lint is and it, it will pull off. Otherwise, a certain amount of lint just has to stay and then I'm going to use do use Photoshop or other um, uh, pixel tools to um, get rid of those spots because they're going to pop uh, from the flash that we use in the final picture and they're going to be very apparent. So Photoshopping works out very well. But we have to do a lot of preparation at both ends of the, um, of the uh, process to to get the specimens to look like you're seeing in the pictures. Um, I'll show you how we hold specimens on the um, 
and then we'll go into equipment that works for you. Scott. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead and go ahead. Okay, so the specimens are held, you know, at least in my lab. There's lots of different ways to do this. I'm going to hold this up here. So you can see there's a, a nice green bee, Algo chloropsis sumptuosa, on here from North Carolina. And it's on just a chunk of plasticine, black plasticine, it turns out, clay. And the reason for that is it's very easy to reposition the bee on the clay. So you can squeeze the clay in, the bee rises up in the camera frame, you can push down the pin, you can change the angle of the pin um, right uh, on the clay in, in small increments and it, it will stay that way so that you can position it in front of the camera. So what I'm doing with the camera, and I'll talk about the camera in a second, is I'm looking through the viewfinder or actually normally I'm using the camera software to look at it on the computer and I'm positioning the specimen by those means, pushing and pulling. And the clay actually turns out to be the most efficient way to do that. Um, anything more and you have to get into um, you know, more expensive gimbals and that kind of thing. We still use this. It's totally fine. So I think what I'll do now is talk about our equipment um, and what we're using and you can um, think about how your equipment matches that in terms of functionality and then I'll talk about how to do this kind of thing with um, not even a, you know with cameras that are not quite as fancy as this but will still give you very very good quality pictures. Right. So what I've got here is a uh, Canon Mark II 5D which is now the second model back. There's a more recent one but the basic point here is it's got a very large sensor screen in the back of it and it um, is going to allow images that come in through the lens to be planted at a much higher level of detail than other cameras. So there's, uh, if you look at Nikon or some of the other models, you'll find similar ones at the higher end. So basically we're looking for this full sensor screen kind of model for the highest quality. Again, I want to emphasize that you can use other cameras and you'll get very, very good pictures, not quite to the level but it may not make any difference for you and it certainly is not going to make a difference for sharing these online. And then the lens that we're using is a macro lens. In this particular case it's a manual lens that runs from 1x to 5x. It's Canon 65 MPE if I, if I recall correctly. And um, so what that's going to do, and this is the point in a lot of this kind of macro photography, you want to take the image of the insect here and you want as much of that image to be sitting on top of that sensor screen. So you don't want to play, if you don't have to, with cropping down uh, because you're losing pixels and therefore you're losing a lot of definition if you take um, only have a small, port, a small picture of the bee within your full frame. So your optics are going to allow you to put that image onto the screen. Now, the problem is with this lens is a, in particular when you're going up to 5x or you're going into any kind of macro photography is that while you're being able to create this much larger, this magnified image and put it on that sensor screen, the portion of that picture, in this case the insect, that is actually in focus becomes smaller and smaller. So ultimately we're talking about fractions of a millimeter, microns in other words, that are in focus at the higher magnifications, 5x and, and 4x. And even at 1 to 1, which a lot of macro lenses will do automatically, you usually cannot get an insect specimen to be completely in focus. So I'm not going to talk about it in detail, but the basic process to get around that, to get a completely in focus specimen, which you see in our specimens, when whenever something is not in focus, we purposefully not um, uh, had the camera take pictures back far enough to put the whole specimen in focus. But what you're doing is you're taking a series of pictures at slightly, very slightly different distances and then you're using computer software to combine them back into one completely full um, picture of the, in this case, the bee that we have here, but it could be an insect, it could be flowers too. And the nice thing though is in that combinatorial process the detail remains of those single slices. So you're getting up the very high definition, the high resolution, but you're also gaining back the, um, the, the uh, depth of field. So that's sort of the novel thing here. These cameras have been around. You can take pictures at this level. The stacking software has been around, but the putting it all together is relatively new. 
there's some groups, some forums, macrophotography.net is a really good one. And I have to do a shout out here because it was the Department of Army that showed us this particular technique. Um, they have a more field version for going out into some of their bases and remote areas to take pictures of insects to send back in case they are a pest problem or a disease vector. So they needed it for slightly different reasons, these high resolution ones. But we're taking their system, it was developed by uh, Tony Gutierrez and Graham Snodgrass to put their names there. Um, and um, through collaborative types of things, they've helped us create the same sort of thing, but in a studio. We don't really need to do it in the field. Um, specimens, to get back to them, because we're stacking a series of, uh, of shots, it means that that specimen has to be absolutely, unfortunately, dead, um, because it can't move at all. And additionally, that means that your workspace also has to be extremely uh, stable. So what you want is, in this case, we have a nice government desk. But what you want is something that is very heavy, that's connected to a floor, in this case it's concrete, that is not vibrating very much. And if you have something less, like your table's a little shaky or your floor is not so good, a trick would be to just load it with weight as much as the table could bear. So we have, at other times, put cinder blocks and bricks onto some of our, um, our workspaces to keep things stable. So because you're working at such a fine scale, any little movement between shots means that you might not be able to correct um, the picture and develop it such that everything is in focus and you don't get strange artifacts from the fact that your specimen moved or the vibration occurred in a little bit. You'll get halos and other things. So that's an important thing, as is that as you are taking the pictures, that you are not adding vibration by touching the camera or touching the table. So um, to do these stacks, what you need and what we have here is we put everything on a manual. We don't want any auto-focusing. We don't want the camera to outthink us. And what we need then is some way to move the camera at very tiny increments um, across the face of or the depth of a specimen. So in this particular case, we're using an automated um, uh, slide rail, uh, slide stacker. There are probably several other models out there. And um, there are lots of homebrews. Um, so I'll show some of the um, possibilities in the, the next phase of this um, demonstration. But you just need to be able to move this camera at slightly different distances in a very regular way and be able to take pictures. Slight differences because, of course, as you move the camera, you're magnifying very slightly the image itself. That's corrected for in the software. But um, you don't want to add uh, vibration um, or a uh, parallax kind of issue with the uh, specimens as you go along. So again, the, the key is stability. Look, my computer went out. There we go. Okay, so um, what? Uh, not to get into a lot of detail um, because this is ge very general talk. But there's in the stack shot here. There's a controller that allows me to set the outer edge, the inner edge, and I can program the distances that I want a, um, the camera to shoot a picture. Um, so, so Sam, with the distances, with the distances you, you're setting there, is there, uh, is there some magic formula that you use to know like how many shots you need to take, or, or between well, how many is, shots between each one? This is, Scott, this is why we all went to high school, so we can figure this out. Let me show you each lens, and that magnification of a lens will have online somewhere, you can look it up, is a table of depth of field. So here's one for our 100 millimeter, which I'm not showing. And what that will tell you is, for a given set of settings, what the you know depth of field is in microns or whatever their you know uh, decimal millimeters. And from that, all you do is this is sort of getting to do it yourself things. But we created a table which is just taped here that at whatever magnification this this um, variable zoom one is working at, we can figure out, the, we now know the number of microns. And we simply look it up on this table and put it in there. So each lens will have a different um, setting for depths of field that you'll have to create. Um, but it's, uh, the, the basic formula is whatever the depth of field, you want to move your camera half that distance. And the reason for that is you want your shots to overlap by about that much. They have to overlap some. Obviously then you would, if you don't, in other words you move too far, you're going to have uh, 
focused areas, unfocused areas, focused areas, unfocused areas on your image. So better to err on the side of overlapping too much. That's why the half mark. The software will take care of it. Um, so that's the focusing part. Um, it's done automatically. Now, the lighting is the other big component of these um, kinds of techniques. So there's a number of ways to do it. I'm going to show you ours, and we'll talk a little bit later about how to do that with um, equipment you have on hand. We're using a set of macro, twin macro flashes. Normally, they would be placed on the camera lens and point at the specimen. But what happens, particularly with bees, which have a lot of shiny skin or integuments, is the reflections from the flash pointed directly onto the specimen are going to be so bright that they will essentially burn out the surface. So we're going to go right up to the complete white part of the spectrum, the pixel spectrum, in the um, ultimate picture. I won't be able to, to resolve any of the details. And again, I'm very interested, as are many people when they do insect work, um, is I want that, the details of that surface topography. So we can't have the flash pointed at the specimen, but in our case, what we do and again, there's lots of different ways, is we use a, um, the high-tech high um, beer cooler, actually this might have been the specimen cooler, um, to uh, reflect the, um, the light. So what's happening is the, um, the uh, flashes are pointed to the sides. They're pointed laterally to the sides of, can you see that pretty well? Not quite. There we go. They're pointed laterally to the box. They're bouncing up and around the box and coming back down. Now, a lot of people will try and completely remove through diffusers, and diffusers can be super simple, um, anything from uh, pieces of lucite cutting board to tissue paper, toilet paper, to disperse the light even more. So they'll put in diffusers. We're doing that effectively with, through the bouncing process, but we like the fact in our pictures, because we consider our pictures to be more of a portraiture um, uh, end of the spectrum than a complete uh, blanket uh, lighting, is we like the fact that there are small amounts of highlights. Not enough to completely disguise the surface or to burn it out, but to give it some three-dimensionality, and I think you know it adds beauty to the whole thing. So, um, but it's up to the individual person. And if you look online, the biggest variable is how people are going to light their specimens. Other people will go and get small but high-powered LED lamps and completely line the area, usually three, to light their specimen. That also works. Um, additionally, because we want to have as part of our, um, uh, what we consider to be the best way to exhibit the specimen, we want a black background. And there's a couple reasons for that. Traditionally, most macro photography, at least in the studio, would be on a white or a gray background. And we find um, that's OK, and it does illustrate the specimen's characteristics to some extent. It's also very distracting. White background is so white that the specimen is overwhelmed by the whiteness. Your eye is mostly trying to process all that white area. Gray, which is the traditional neutral color that you would do in straight scientific illustrations, is um, a color that just we normally don't find appealing, frankly. You don't put gray things behind your um, couch, for example, or throughout your house. No one lives in a gray house, at least that I know of. Then you have to ask, why is all, all government furniture is gray? But um, that's another topic. So um, we go with black for uh, both for the, because it presents a specimen in the best light. In other words, the thing that's bright in the portrait is the specimen and the details of the specimen. The background is immaterial. And the fact that we can zero out completely the background to absolute black, zero, zero, zero in pixel land. And that allows us to do some really nice um, Photoshopping and border tricks because it's absolutely black. I won't go into those details, um, but if people email me, we can send them information about the post-processing part of it. So how we're doing that, you can't see it in our setup here, but behind the specimen, so it would be in that direction, just on the wall is a big piece of black felt. Now the Army guys, they use velvet, black velvet. You know, it's just one of those things that we have our favorites. Their notion is that the velvet has a, a larger nap that sucks up more light. And what you want is that the flash, or whatever your light is, is not also illuminating the black.
black background or as little as possible because otherwise you're going to have to trick the picture later to push that background even blacker. So one thing would be when you're taking your pictures, you turn the lights off in the room. And the other is to try and minimize either, like what we've done, we've pulled the desk out away from the wall so that less flash bouncing around inside is leaking onto the background. And um, there's additional tricks. So if you look at our uh, bounce rig, you see that in the back here, it's cut out so that the uh, black background is showing through, but we're eliminating light from the rest of the room and uh, still bouncing. And then we have up in the front part here, we get the angle right. We have a place, but it's minimal, where the um, camera lens is going to move through. And this is down here is for cords. Um, again, lots of different ways to do this. Um, but working out the lighting is very important. And a nice feature of, of the higher end um, cameras is that you have the ability on uh, your computer next door here to um, play around with test shots and look at the, um, the uh, pictures in a series of iterations, like well, what happens if I change it this way, what happens if I change it that way. And setting up your studio, which this is, is important. Um, so those, I think, are the basics in terms of um, the setup. We have a simple stand just to elevate the um, specimens up to the, uh, the height. Um, we talked about flash. Anything else I'm missing, Scott? So, so when you, what, once you've taken all these pictures in these various increments, um, what, how exactly do you stack those? I mean, what is the, the basic, uh, you know, there's a number of different pieces of software, yeah. software out there, but what is the software that you use um, okay. to stack those photos? Yeah, we use a, a software package called Zareen Stacker. There's uh, about four others, including uh, one that's free called Combine Z. So, again, this is a, a, a way... None of these are super expensive, but Combine Z is, is absolutely free. It's a, uh, a way that you can play around with this technique. You can also do it right in Photoshop. Photoshop, uh, at least the version 5 and 6, have a photo stacking um, algorithm somewhere in there. I've not used it um, because I'm, I'm just more used to using the dedicated um, uh, software. They all work about the same. Well, I'm going to tell you the general pattern, how it magically knows what's in focus and not. I have no... No idea, but the um, we have now after we after we do this, um, just got. I said it's all magic. <laughs> it is magic. Yeah. Um, so what's going to happen? And actually, I'm just going to run. I've got this set up to take some pictures. Well, no, it's just going to show flashes and slight movements. So we're going to end up with somewhere between 15 and maybe 300 pictures, all at slightly different distances and slightly different parts of those pictures in focus for an individual specimen. And then the software package, we're going to give it some parameters. You know, you can vary how the um, camera uh, or the software takes and uh, manipulates the pictures, but it's pretty straightforward. And then it will combine it and output. You have, of course, a lot of different output um, types from TIFF files to JPEGs, um, a finished picture and depending on the software package, you can go back in and tweak things, run it again, like and um, get rid of halos and some of the other kinds of problems that are artifacts of the stacking technique. Sure. Um, but uh, we're more of a production out, uh, um, outfit. So other people in other groups, you can see um, even nicer photographs of insects where people have spent a huge amount of time fine-tuning um, you know, their lenses and their eyes and the lighting, and then particularly the photoshopping and the stacking afterwards. Um, we just don't have the time for that, and that's not our, you know, that's not our objective. It's right. really good pictures at a re reasonable rate. Um, sure. Yeah, go ahead. So, so from uh, from those people at home that are, are watching, you know, looking at this, I look at this, and it obviously looks like there's some expensive equipment you've got going on here. Obviously, in the photography world, not everything is always inex inexpensive. So. Um, if someone does have their own camera, uh, what what exactly can they do to mimic this sort of stacking process that you've got um, instead of the slider, instead of the photo stacking device there? Right. While you're talking, Scott, I'm going to set that up and give some ideas. But um, I'm just going to remove these over if I can pretty easily and show people uh, a general way. The idea here is that there's lots of different ways to do this. 
I just want to show you how you can take a, um, a any old camera. So here's just uh, a pretty junky, I shouldn't maybe say junky, but an LS old camera. And all I've done is screwed it into a piece of plywood so that the screw, where is that screw, is right there, is recessed, and I've flattened the bottom. You can do a better job than I can in terms of a prettier piece of wood. And now I can, that allows me to uh, move the camera by hand if I wanted to. Um, I was just uh, talking by email with someone who had modified a, um, a dot, old dot matrix printer to create a rail, so to speak, to move the camera at these small increments. Now, let me uh, see if I can do this right. Let me unplug a couple of things. This is not going to unplug the video conference and bring up a table that I can work on here so, and do a little demonstration. So if you use this, uh, if you're using this block of wood, obviously to kind of get the best you know, motion out of the wood, you're going to want to sand it. You're going to want to uh, make sure you're obviously you're, the surface of your table is clean or you've got a smoother surface. Uh, that one right there as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah, so again, remember any kind of movement, extra movement, um, that you introduce into the process of taking a stack of pictures is going to diminish the quality of the uh, picture at the end. So um, weighting things down, being able to take the picture with a remote rest versus taking, you know, mashing the button with your hand are all going to increase the probability that you'll come out with a, a nice picture like you're seeing on the screen. The fancier cameras are going to have bigger sensors and maybe some gizmos, but the reality is that any kind of camera that can be set onto manual and has a macro lens on it, or you can use your normal 55 millimeter lens and add what are called extension tubes, which are essentially just tubes that bring the lens out further and increase the magnification effectively. And also have you can put have diopters are called, which are really just magnifying lenses on the front of it. They both have problems that we talked about earlier, which is that it decreases the light coming in, so you'll need an external light uh, flash of some kind, and it also um, uh, decreases your depth of field by quite a bit. So, but we talked about how to resolve that with the other equipment, so this, the idea is the same. And um, so here are two things I wanted to show. One is I can go with my equipment, and here's this is an old copy um, or these copy stands. There's tons of them around because no one does this anymore. And so you can buy them, but the nice thing is that it does what we want in a way, which is it increments up and down as I run this um, knob. So you can attach, because it has, I all have screws, your camera to this, and you can run a scale along the, um, the, uh, the tree here that allows you to move the camera at these particular increments. Again, I would weight this surface down quite a bit. Alternatively, if you want something more on the uh, horizontal surface like we did, you can take, here's a, a very high quality ruler, um, and, and by high quality I mean that the, the increments of the, um, of the, uh, the markings are, are precise because, again, we're moving at the micron or sub-millimeter level to move the camera. And so by simply taping this down and using the edge of your block of wood to run it against, you have what are is the poor man's you know, stack shot. So you can move, the ruler is going to keep the um, camera fixed in one place, camera's fixed to the block of wood, and if you put, it doesn't matter where, some kind of very fine marker, you could embed a pin, uh, you know, there's a thousand ways to do this, so that you know that by moving a certain distance, you can measure the distance, okay? So, like, you, if you determine that you need to move one millimeter, then you want to very accurately move it one millimeter um, as possible. Now, it doesn't have to be absolute, because, remember, we're, we're overlapping our shots. So, but you need some way to keep the camera stable and to know how far to go. And then you could just press the button to take your picture, and then continue that process on down, I would suggest you would want to actually probably buy a remote trigger of some kind so that your the physical process of pressing that button is not going to put in vibration into the um, camera lens. And then if you have the normal 
uh, kind of uh, flash, which is a, a large head flash, I don't have one on here, um, for taking pictures of people, you can um, simply uh, do something like here, I've got a big styrofoam box. You can attach a styrofoam box over the top and bounce the flash up and down and get again, uh, some very nice lighting um, doing that. You can also add white to the bottom. Um, by doing this iteratively, you can see um, what surfaces need to be reflective so that you're getting light coming up from the bottom and from the top on your specimens. Lots of ways to do that. If you're taking pictures vertically, you can do something like this, which is build your own sort of black, black box, which is just a cardboard box lined with black. You put the um, specimen above it, and then you block as much of the box uh, as possible so that light from the flash is not going into the box. It's just the black surface. Creates the same black background as before. Um, a couple other tricks. One is with lighting is um, something that the, uh, the Army guys showed me. They're into all kinds of low-tech styrofoam cup um, taped together um, in the middle. Um, there is a uh, little aperture here at the end. You can see it's just they cut out a little piece and allows you to open that up and snap it onto your lens. And what that creates is a hood that you can flash light up into. And with these small camera flashes or any other kind of bounce up into type of thing. And also what that means is that the distance that the um, flash is traveling is very short and that means that you can get away with very, very low levels of flash. So you set your flash settings down to 1 64th or 1 32nd, those kinds of levels. And what that effectively means is when you have flash that's flashing at only those um, increments, it's, it's stopping um, the maximum amount of motion. So the way a flash bulb works is that the more, the more you push the flash up, in other words, you're producing more light, the longer the flash is occurring. And in this kind of photography, the flash is actually not the, tr not the, um, the shutter and the shutter speed. The flash is what's stopping motion. So if you can go to a lower flash amount, you then effectively can stop more of the motion that even if you've introduced some shake into the picture, um, it's going to help control it. So what they're doing is they're flashing up into this, this high-tech hood, and it then um, illuminates the, and because it's round, um, it's, per, you know, it's a nice little parabola. And many, many people who do this kind of work, they mostly work with styro pieces of styrofoam cups and clamshells from fast food joints to create their uh, light bounce. You can buy similar things um, for a lot more money, but again, we're doing it ourselves. Okay, a couple more things. If you have specimens, as sometimes uh, people do, that are very soft bodied. In other words, they're a larva. We've done pictures online. You can see this uh, mosquito larvae and other things that you simply cannot take a picture of in air because they collapse or they um, are covered with alcohol and they simply look bad. So you need to take them in some kind of fluid, usually alcohol. Sometimes that creates problems because um, taking a picture directly in alcohol, they will. there's no way to fix them. There's no pin or anything, and they will rotate. Well, if you use, um, play around with hand sanitizer here, um, hand sanitizer is nothing more than gelled alcohol, with a, depending on the, the type, some scents um, and other things which you'd want to minimize. And what you can do is you can put them uh, the specimen into, uh, there's other ways to do this, but this works really well. You can, if you want to take a picture of a specimen vertically, you would add hand sanitizer to this type of thing. These are called cuvettes. Maybe you can see if I get close. And this is a ten, one centimeter by one centimeter box that chemists use to um, analyze the spectral um, uh, characteristics of chemical mixes. So they have to have good light quality going through there and um, uh, for their thing. But we can also fill this with hand sanitizer. We have techniques for getting rid of the bubbles and such too. And um, then you just embed your specimen. And the nice thing is that the specimen can be moved around. And if it's soft bodied, it usually was you know, preserved in alcohol a lot of times. It's compatible with the, the fluid and um, it just stays wherever you put it. So it'll just float in space. 
Um, you do, because of the nature of alcohol and hand sanitizer, they both are about equally problematic, you lose a little bit of sharpness. You can see on our uh, Flickr site, we have a whole series of things in a set that are specimens in hand sanitizer, and they're not quite as sharp, but they're actually you know, far better, and a lot of people actually like those pictures, than um, many other kinds of techniques of simply taking a picture of something in a Petri dish. Um, if you really want to get fancy, you can buy, uh, so these are plastic, I'll show this. These come in large trays. You can just do a Google search on um, plastic cuvettes, and um, on the image is defined where to buy these. Scientific houses have them. You can buy them um, and surplus a lot, too. Um, here are, if you want to go up one level of quality, you can get what are called fused quartz cuvettes, and those are made of, obviously, fused quartz, and they have much better light characteristics. Um, you are incrementing your abilities doing that um, at a cost since they're about $150 each, uh, but it is slightly better optically. And um, if you look on our Flickr site, we're playing around with that technique um, more and trying to work out how to take the best kind of shot of specimens in alcohol. But right now our main problem is not the wall of glass of the, um, the container, um, but the problems of alcohol and hand sanitizer itself as a fluid and air combination that is fuzzing the, um, fuzzing the resolution a little bit. I'd say you're 95% there with you that. Um, see, there was a couple other things. One is, um, this is another high-tech technique that the Army has developed. So here's the bottom of a styrofoam cup, and you see there's a pin in there. I don't know if you can see it very well. But what there is is it's a pin holder. I'm going to take the pin out. Um, well, you may not. So see, it's carved out, and there's a pin coming down the center, and there's a, in the top here, this is hard to see because the white's burning out the, the uh, visual. There's a slot that's just knifed into the top. This, this holds the pin in place. And what it allows you to do is put a specimen on cotton or some other place and very slowly drop this pin down onto the specimen um, with a dab of super glue. So super glue is our friend. And uh, the, um, that type of thing, I forget what the name of it is, technical name. But um, by doing that, um, you can very, very delicately glue the specimen to the pin and then use that for photography, particularly if you stick it into clay. And the reason that that is useful is because the specimens that you can take pictures of are so small that, uh, you know, with our fat fingers, it's very difficult for us to manipulate the specimen and attach the pin in the proper way without um, having it flop over or the glue get all over the place. This very simple... Um, styrofoam device allows very precise um, pinning of uh, specimens with glue. You just leave it in place, 15 minutes later you can pick it up and move it to your photography studio. I think, oh, um, another interesting device is our acupuncture needles. So they're very fine, so that means you have less to Photoshop out later, and they can be bent. Um, they're uh, often available through uh, acupuncturists who um, either have the uh, used needles that they don't need anymore um, or because they, um, they're they all disposable, I believe, or they have, go out of date for some reason and they'll probably just give them to you. Um, they're great because they're fine and um, you, they take bends very well. Um, I think I'm pretty much, I think that's all I had I wanted to cover. Yeah, you got quite a bit of uh, options there for folks that want to do a do-it-yourself sort of um, macro photography at, at home. So that's that's really good. I appreciate uh, you showing everybody this. Um, sure. So you see the high end spectrum. You see the lower end spectrum. Uh, what you can do for yourself, and and the end result, of course, is you've got a really good detailed uh, insect. Whether it's good enough for you to kind of share online, or whether you're doing something that is. Um, higher end, like you're trying to do for more detailed insect macro photography to share for specific reasons for monitoring and, and kind of keeping up with the specimens and, and uh, identifying specimens out there. So that's um, that's that's really good. I appreciate you sharing all that. Yeah. Uh, There's really no reason that people can't produce the same quality of pictures with any relatively good camera that we do. And um, I should also point out that Combine Z is free stacking. Routine GIMP is a free um, Photoshop-esque um, 
uh, you know, pixel manipulating things. So all the tools are available, and if you've got the camera, then you need relatively little more to do the same thing. And we really encourage people to take these pictures because it adds to the information available. Sometimes we find actually totally new species by looking through people's um, pictures. And if they're crappy pictures, of course, we can't tell. But if they're really high quality ones, then, you know, we discover new species because we're not, there's very few of us. And people taking pictures discover all kinds of um, neat things. Right. Um, and um, it also allows people to work with uh, groups like iNaturalist and um, Encyclopedia of Life and Discover Life to add pictures of these things. Great. Right. Well, Sam, I, I wanted to say you know, that's about all the time we have for today. Um, again, I want to thank you and, uh, for showing us these uh, different techniques. Um, I, I, amazing. It's fascinating to kind of see the behind-the-scenes sort of work that you do, uh, and it, I'm sure others will appreciate the fact that um, you provided some do-it-yourself solutions. So, uh, you bet. Yeah. So uh, with that, I also want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, Can I add one thing, Scott, before you completely sign out? Oh, sure, sure. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> That is that um, we use, <laughs> this is uh, totally uh, gratuitous, but we use volunteers all the time in our labs, taking pictures and doing, you know, working with specimens. So if anyone's in the Beltsville, Maryland area, just uh, give a shout out. We'll put you on camera, you know, taking. And, uh, and hopefully some of your pictures will end up on our website too. So uh, continue on. Call for arms there. Great. So uh, thanks, Sam. And uh, again, like I said, thanks everyone for joining in for the Google Hangout for today. We definitely appreciate it. Um, let us know. Leave some comments on the uh, on the hangout uh, invite, or uh, you know, send us a tweet on Twitter uh, to uh, at USGS, um, or you can reach us through our Facebook page, uh, USGS uh, US Geological Survey, and um, just let us know uh, what you thought of the hangout, and if you have any future ideas for other hangouts you might be interested in. Uh, that's always good. We're always interested in taking suggestions. So again, um, thanks a lot. Uh, and up on the screen right now, we have uh, uh, the contact information for Sam and, of course, the link to the uh, Flickr site that you can see the photos for yourself. Uh, and, of course, uh, one thing I, I would hate, I, I do want to mention, of course, is that all of these photos are, because they're created by the U.S. government, they are free for taking, free for use, um, and we definitely appreciate everyone taking a look at those photos and using them in, in uh, creative ways. So that's it. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Scott. Thanks.